Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Bible Study for Wednesday, April 27, 2016. Tonight, Dave Bovey continues the Life Light Study on Prophecy, and we take a look at Session 1, Day 1, on Amos chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. Let's listen in. So let's go ahead with um, Psalm 38. I'll read the bold, and if you'll respond with the... Uh, the uh, odd verses or the other verses. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Because of your wrath there is no health in my body. My bones have no soundness because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden too heavy to bear. I wait for you, O Lord, and you will answer, O Lord, my God. For I am about to fall and my pain is ever with me. I confess my iniquity. I am troubled by my sin. O Lord, do not forsake me. Be not far from me, O my God. Come quickly and help me, O Lord, my Savior. Let's join together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us. We thank you for salvation that you have given us through your Son and our Lord, Jesus Christ. We ask your blessing upon us here tonight as we continue to study your word and take up the study of the book of Amos. We also ask that you bless those within our congregation who are ill, who are suffering in some way, especially be with Janice as she travels to Boise to take care of her parents. Give her strength, courage, and a safe journey back home. We ask you also to be with Sheldon, Rosa, and Nina as they travel to to Mexico to visit family. We ask that you be with them, give them safe journeys, and also with Rocco, and bring them once again safely back to us. All these things we ask tonight in your name. Amen. Okay. Well, we're already doing better than we did this morning. <laughs> it was almost 10.30 before we started this morning. They got off on tangents. and you got a lot more people in the morning class. Yeah, it's a little, little more. Yeah. And I think it has been all along. So that's all right. We'll go a little quicker here. Um, what I would like to do as a starting point is to put out some background material on Amos so that we have some idea of what's going on, um, some of the historical context, Sometimes um, you can read through some of these prophets. You can read through any of the books of the Bible. And if you don't really have an idea of what's going on, sometimes it doesn't make sense what's being said. And so uh, to kind of help with that, um, I'll spend probably about 30 minutes at the most, maybe 20, um, with a little bit of background, not just about Amos himself, but what's going on in that part of the world at that time because it does have an impact on what Amos is going to say and, and some of the judgments that he's going to bring about. First of all, um, <clears throat> the, the questions jump around a little bit for the first part, um, but if you just go ahead and open your Bible to uh, Amos chapter 1 and, and we'll go from there. One of the first things that uh, Amos does is tell us a little bit about himself. And in the first part of um, chapter 1 there, he tells us that he was one of the shepherds of Tekoa. Now, Tekoa is a little village just south of Jerusalem. So at this point in time, we have Judah and Israel the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom. This is uh, probably about, well, let's see, uh, David was about 1020 BC. Uh, this is roughly in the 750, so we're talking 250 to 270 years after King David. Um, I would guess, let's see if I've got some, some real numbers here rather than just guessing. Um, the kingdom split in some place close to uh, 922 BC. So we're about uh, 170 years after the split of the kingdom. Hi, Kevin. 
so there's two kingdoms. One is the northern kingdom, one is the southern kingdom at this point in time. And Amos is from the southern kingdom, but his mission and ministry is going to be to the northern kingdom. Um, so he comes from a group of shepherds. He's also uh, what's called a dresser or tender of fig trees. And, you know, if you really look at what they did with these trees, apparently they slashed the fruit to get them to ripen quicker. So that's what he did for a living. Um, he's basically a rancher. Okay? He's got sheep and trees. And if you look around the county here, we've got lots of those kind of people around. Now, why would he tell you that? type of information? Why would he give you that information? Well, later in one of the verses it mentioned then that he was not like a professional prophet or a son of a prophet. Right. He's telling you that he's an ordinary guy. Yeah. He, he doesn't come from a line of prophets. His father wasn't a prophet. He wasn't a prophet. He was just a rancher, a farm boy, a country hick, whatever you want to call him. But he's far from a professional um, um, professional prophet and he is called by God in spite of what may appear to be a lack of qualifications Okay, but he's called by God and told go to the northern kingdom which <clears throat> um, there was a lot of discussion this morning about Jonah and going to Nineveh I think Jonah had a better deal than, than Amos did by going into the northern kingdom because that would have been very hostile ground for anybody from, from Judah. Um, he worked during the reign of two kings and you can find this in um, oh, Second Kings chapter 14 or thereabouts, uh, roughly verse 23. Uh, you have to look both sides of that to find it. But he worked uh, during the reign of two kings. One was Uzziah of Judah and Uzziah was considered a good king. You know, the, those of you who are in crossways, we had that chart that showed good kings, bad kings. All the kings of Israel or the northern kingdom were considered bad, but there were a few on Judah that were considered bad, but most, you know, a lot of them were considered good too. Uzziah was one that was considered good. But the king of uh, Israel, and, and I probably ought to be careful and just use the terms northern, southern kingdom because we get confused otherwise. But the northern kingdom had a king called Jeroboam again. Now remember that Jeroboam was the one who was involved in the split of the kingdom way back right after Solomon. This is Jeroboam II. Um, he's considered evil. Uh, and in fact, if you go to uh, Second Kings... Chapter 14, verse 23. <clears throat> 2 Kings 23. Um, let's see. And what it says is in the 15th year of Amaziah, which is another name for Uzziah, uh, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel became king in Samaria. What verse are you in? Uh, 23 of chapter 14. And he reigned for 41 years. Now the next verse is telling. Verse 24, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins that Jeroboam son of Nebat um, which he had caused Israel to commit. This is, Jeroboam the second is just as bad as Jeroboam the first. And we'll talk about uh, the sins here in a little bit, exactly what they were. But Jeroboam, son of Nebat, was one involved in the split of the kingdom. Okay? Rehoboam was the son of Solomon at that point in time that was involved. Okay. If you read some of, of the um, history here, 
as well as extra biblical history, what you find is that this was actually a good time um, economically in the life of the northern kingdom. There was a great deal of wealth, um, considerable prosperity. Uh, unfortunately, in <clears throat> that part of the world, with huge wealth all come, also comes large uh, quantities of poverty. Um, there was no real strong king in Assyria to the north. At this point in time, there will be, not too long after this. Um, and so the, the Assyrians really had no interest in coming down to Israel and taking over and, and trying to conquer them at this point. They will shortly. Um, <clears throat> so Jeroboam the second was left to uh, to basically deal with uh, what are called Aramaeans here or Syrians, which is another group uh, to the north. And these people had actually annexed part of Israel at one point, probably a couple decades before this. Um, so his father had actually started to try to take back some of this land and he continues the restoration and ultimately he ends up with boundaries that push actually north of Damascus all the way down to the Dead Sea now that's approximately 250 miles as the crow flies which doesn't seem like much to us but it's probably bigger than the kingdom David had so that's a lot of land. You know, we, we kind of lose track of the size of Israel. It's not very big. You know, I, I looked just here the other day, and it's about 700 miles from one end of California to the southern border, from the north border to the southern border. Roughly, uh, you know, 175, 200 miles across. Well, that's a pretty good sized state. Not as big as Texas, perhaps. But it's, it's big. Israel was small. You know, we can, uh, at the time of David, you could probably fit most of Israel into L.A. County. It's that small. So this is actually quite a bit of territory that he's controlling at this point in time. But unfortunately, along with all his military conquests, the economic prosperity they had, <clears throat> They um, expanded territories, and even a, uh, almost an extreme sense of nationalistic pride came a huge spiritual corruption. And that corruption had actually started at the split of the kingdom. So, you know, if you think about it from the standpoint of all the military victories and expansions that he went through, he was probably the northern kingdom's most successful king. Are you talking about Jeroboam? Jeroboam the Boam the second, yes. Um, <clears throat> he had actually introduced quite a bit in the way of international trade into the kingdom. Uh, and with that came wealthy merchants. Uh, the cities were full of these merchants with, uh, the Bible would describe them as stone houses. Now, <clears throat> Perhaps that doesn't sound so attractive to us today, but a stone house in those days was very permanent, very um, luxurious compared to what everybody else had. And many of these were actually lined with ivory on the inside. Now we, of course, get into trouble for doing that today, but you can think of other ways in which we adorn our houses, um, <clears throat> and especially the upper class, that would make them mansions. Um, so superficially it looks like this is the golden age of the northern kingdom and from an economic standpoint yeah it probably is however what has been discovered through archaeology and um, even looking at the writings of Amos here is that there's really a very different lifestyle going on in these towns um, there have been a number of excavations that have uncovered some of the old buildings. And they'll see the stone mansions, but they'll also see evidence of where the poor used to live. And these are, um, 
I guess I would compare it in some cases to some of the scenes that I saw in Tijuana probably in the 70s where you'd walk across the border and there's these cardboard shacks, okay? Something very similar to that. Um, many of them were on the outside of the city wall and they were just simply lean-tos against the city wall. But they're on the outside, which means they're not protected. The city wall was there for protection against um, invaders. The mansions were, of course, inside. So <laughs> both archaeology and um, um, <clears throat> Amos paint a different picture of some parts of society uh, than this rich, prosperous uh, nation. David, yes. Just, uh, not to distract us, but very no, briefly, sorry. international trade, ivory, of course, would come from somewhere in Africa. Probably. What, what else? What other... Well, you'd have... I mean, just to paint a picture around this... Yeah, you, you would have uh, uh, spice caravans coming from um, Asia, China, uh, India, some places like that. Um, and if you look at <clears throat> Israel and its geographical location, if you were coming from Egypt and not going by ship, but coming from Egypt and going to Rome, where would you go? You'd go up the eastern side of the Mediterranean right through Israel and then on to Rome or Greece or someplace Greece, over there. Yes. Uh, coming from the Arabian Peninsula, it would be the same thing. You would go through there. So it was very typically a uh, uh, trade route. And so you've got that access to the international Even that early. Yes. Oh, yes. Years. Yes. Um, also, um, with all that wealth, it was an indication that they were not caring for the poor. Okay, that's what we're coming to. You read my notes? You can't see these. Uh. <laughs> she does best. Yeah. Oh. You might be smart. <laughs> I'm sure you are. Um, so, you know, we've got this contrast between the mansions of the rich and these just utter poverty of probably a large portion of the people. Now, Amos is going to describe in, in various sections here uh, how the rich trampled on the poor. And I think you can even see that today in some cases, perhaps not quite to the extent of this, but perhaps it's very similar. Justice in the court system depended on how much money you had. Well, I'm not sure you call that justice, do you? Okay. Now, w we joke about some of the court decisions that come down but <clears throat> in our land today, but in reality, if you think about most of the court decisions, they're generally fairly um, reasonable. Okay. But that wasn't the case here. If you had money, you were in great shape. You could buy the judge. You could bribe him. If you didn't have money, you were out of luck. Um, so the wealth of the individual actually determined what justice was um, meted out. Um, merchants cheated. There's all kinds of ways they could cheat. You know, you, you have this picture of them sitting there with the thumb on the scale. You remember the, the good old days when you'd go into the grocery store and there was honestly a meat market there and you said, I want this. And they took it and put it up on the scale and then wrapped it. Right. Well, you can think of them holding their thumb on the scale to increase the weight by, you know, half a pound or so. Well, you end up paying more, right? Even back then, there were ways of doing that, either putting your thumb on the scale, biasing it in some way, or short measures. A lot of scales were actually these balance scales. You know, there was a center balance like this. You, the object to be weighed here. And then the standards, you know, you had a one pound weight or whatever it happened to be. Well, if you made the weight a little different, you could cause it to go one way or the other. And so um, there were dishonest scales, dishonest merchants. Um, of course, we complain about price gouging, particularly with gasoline here. Price gouging is not new. That was one of the charges, basically, that Amos leveled against the merchants. They were charging 
prices that were way too high. And probably once again, um, targeting the poor. Um, th there's other things in there, and we might get to them in some of the, the questions, but th the bottom line is you've got this society that is really biased towards the wealthy, towards the, the uh, rich, and against the poor. It's still that way today. To some degree. With, yeah. In the automotive industry, the, uh, uh, the markup of parts, 100% oh. markup of parts. Oh, yeah. Um, it's awful. Well, even like in grocery stores, the same chain, the prices are different in different neighborhoods. Yeah. Now that, you know they're buying and paying the same price for all yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's all kinds of things like that that happened back then. They, they happen to some degree here. Um, what was also going on at this time was uh, there were all kinds of religious ceremonies. It looked like from a religious standpoint, they were going through all the motions. They had their festivals, they had their sacrifices, but they didn't have the godly living to go with it. And they complained if the Sabbath interfered with them making more money. Yes, that, that's a good stop. one. <clears throat> they wanted the service to be over with real quick so they could get back to business, which was cheating. Okay. So this idea of resting on the Sabbath um, was really resting, God. resting from the church service. Okay, it's it's like um, you know you may have seen church um, groups that will say, well, our services are only you know fifty five minutes long or whatever it happens to be. That way you can get back out there and do whatever you want to do. Wait a second, time out, folks. That's exactly what they were doing here, except they were returning. To their businesses to cheat to steal to gouge um, so superficially it looks like the ceremonies the sacrifices are going on but not really so um, if you have Amos there we're going to go through this real quick before we get to the to the questions um, <clears throat> beginning with chapter uh, one When we were looking at the book of the Revelation, there was a number that came up quite often, and it was the number seven. Does anybody remember what it stood for? It's the perfect completion. Completion, yeah. Okay, remember that. And I want you to keep track of the number of nations. Okay? That's, that's all the hint you get. That ought to be enough. <laughs> Okay, as we go through this, I'm going to go through it real fast, not spend a whole lot of time on it right now. But chapter 1, chapter 2 are really what we would call oracles or judgments against nations. And they are specifically against nations surrounding the northern kingdom. Okay? And Amos is going to announce these judgments to the northern kingdom. The first oracle, which is in... Um, Chapter 1, it begins with verse 3. Um, for three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because she threshed Gilead with sleds having iron teeth. Okay. Um, Gilead is the territory kind of... I think it's just north of the Sea of Galilee, but it's uh, east of the Jordan River. So it would be in the general area of Jordan, maybe extending up to uh, what is now Syria, okay, in the Golan Heights. Oh, you're looking at a map? Yeah. Yeah. Might. Yeah, if you look at um, the backs of some of your uh, study Bibles, you'll, you'll probably find those. I've got a map here, so if anybody wants to take a look. Um, but the first one is against uh, Syria, Damascus. This is also called the Arameans. Okay? Now, the picture here of this threshing of Ge uh, Gilead was taking this sled with iron teeth pointed down and dragging it. Now, there are some people that say this metaphorical that it's just the utter destruction of Gilead. I don't 
I don't buy that. You know, not that I'm a biblical scholar, but I don't buy that because the the Babylonians actually did something very similar to this um, about 140 years from now, from this point in time. They would actually run it through a crowd of people or down through the city streets, and if you were in the way, you were literally ripped to pieces. The cruelty of some of these invading nations during this period of time is just beyond comprehension. You know, you didn't just simply get shot by a bullet and die. You were shredded and torn apart. Uh, it created terror. It obviously killed a lot of people in a very uh, cruel way. Um, but that's the charge that's being brought here. And so we're going to see that if you go on to the Babylonian uh, captivity and the sieges of uh, Jerusalem and the surrounding area, you would see that there also. Um, <clears throat> so judgment is going to come on the, on the Syrians. And uh, there's a passage right at the end of chapter, f uh, chapter 1, verse 5, that's a little uh, obscure if you don't know some of the, the uh, terms that are there. The people of Aram, which is Syria, Aramaeans, okay, uh, will go into exile to Kir. Now, I, does anybody know what Kir is? No. Yeah. See that? It, it's a it's a funny name, but it's actually in Assyria. This is, you know, the, the capital of Assyria at, at this point in time was probably Nineveh. Um, and the Assyrians are going to come up in power and take over the Syrians. So it gets fun to trade these names, the Assyrians and the Syrians and the, you know, <laughs> back and forth. But they, they are going to be taken off into exile and really uh, disappear at that point in time. What does exile mean exactly? Um, when a country invaded, typically what they did is they took the local people out and took them back to their own country, and that was exile. Whoa. And then they brought in people, okay? And when, when we get to that part where um, the Assyrians come in and actually take over the northern kingdom, they'll take them out, scatter them throughout the kingdom, and then they put their own people in. And there's actually some left in uh, the northern kingdom, generally the poor. They didn't care so about them. meant to disperse them? So they get rid of them okay. by dispersing them. Some actually used them for various reasons. Um, but what will happen is that the people they brought in to the northern kingdom intermarried with the poor that were there. And by the time of Jesus, they're called Samaritans. And this is the Samaritan woman at the well. She is descended from those people. Okay. I would think that in the archaeological digs, when they get down to 1000 BC, which is probably a couple of thousand feet maybe, that they would find iron, still find iron sledges. It's in the Bible. It's, it's almost got to be. It, it's there someplace. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know how long iron actually lasts. Exactly, but it's deep. It would be buried, depending on how much uh, water and mm -hmm. oxygen was in the soil. Why it would, it could start to decay. Um, so that's, that's the first one. Now it continues on. Um, the second one they go, uh, that Amos goes after is Gaza. We've heard that name. And this is about where the Gaza Strip is today. It's on the coast. Um, it's actually between Judah and the Med. So it's right there on the coast. Um, just to the west of the, of the Dead Sea. The next one he's going to go after is um, actually Gaza. And the other name we've seen in the past for this is the Philistines, yes. Yeah. Philistia. Philistia. Uh, the next one is um, Tyre. Uh, these are the Phoenicians. It's probably in the general area of modern day Lebanon. And then we have three more here. Edom. Um, Edom is uh, south of the Dead Sea, south of Judah. It's towards the Arabian Peninsula. 
but it would be down in that area. We have uh, Moab, which would be on the other side, on the east side of the Dead Sea. And then we have Ammon, which is east of the Jordan and um, kind of between the Sea of Galilee or Tiberias and uh, the Dead Sea. How many do I have to this point in time? Oh boy, seven? No. Six. Six. Okay. So there's six, and these are all surrounding the, the northern kingdom and actually um, surrounding Judah also. Now, chapter 2, verse 4. At this point, if you are listening to this in the northern kingdom, you're probably thinking, yeah, he's going to get even with these guys. God's going to take care of our enemies. And that's always been kind of the watchword and battle cry of Israel. God's going to take care of our enemies. Well, God takes care of his enemies. Okay? So they're counting down. They know, they know the uh, biblical numerology. They know the number seven. There's six. And here comes the seventh. In verse 4 of chapter 2, this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Judah. And you can just imagine And when um, Amos pronounces these words, it's like a cheer went up. Here is the northern kingdom and God's going to take care of Judah and get rid of their pain in the, the neck. Okay? Yay! God's going to get them. For three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees, because they have been led astray by false gods, the gods of uh, their ancestors followed. I will send fire upon Judah that will consume the fortress of Jerusalem. And so one of the charges here is against Judah. And that charge is they did not keep the law, which is another way of saying they broke the covenant. And here, you know, I think I mentioned it last week, or at least I should have, one of the jobs of the prophets was to point backwards to the covenant and to remind people of what they had agreed to as a nation. And here's the charge. They're not keeping that. Okay. It is, saith the Lord. It's yes. The Lord is speaking to the, them. Yeah, because the, the very beginning of this is, this is what the Lord says. Hi, question. Okay. Um, when Abraham was negotiating with God over Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, if I can find three good people, mm-hmm. if, I can, if I can find ten good people, and keep, keep whittling it down. Is there any significance to the fact that the Lord is saying here, for two, for three, or four, even four sins, I will not turn my wrath away? For three sins, the, the formula that he's using there for three well, sins? Yeah, and it, it sounds like just the opposite formula, <sighs> where, where Abraham is saying, if I can find you five good people <laughs> yeah. in there, we you spare them? Um, and it seems like the Lord is saying here, for three or even four sins, I still won't turn around. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one, Tom. Of what, the only thing that I was ever able to find on this is this was kind of a formula that they used. And in some cases, the numbers were literal of the sins that would be enumerated. But in most cases, what you had was that the fourth sin is the one they really talked about and it was the worst one. So, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying about... Uh, there probably really isn't any significance I, in no, Abraham. No. He was for Abraham at that point. Um, he was the, actually, the connection between Abraham and what's being done here, there, there is a connection. Um... <clears throat> Do you remember who Edom was? It's cheesemaker. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. That was good. That was good. <laughs> Edom is another name for Esau, Jacob's 
twin brother. Remember? And remember all the problems that he had. And, and Jacob was actually afraid to come back home because of Esau. Um, does anybody remember who Moab and Ammon were? Do you remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Abraham went through all this negotiation with God basically to save Lot. Okay? And the, the angels that had visited Abraham to announce that um, uh, Sarah would be pregnant by that time next year, or give birth by that time next year, continued on to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it. And Lot was told to flee, that he would be saved, along with his wife and two daughters. They were supposed to flee. Don't look back. And of course, as a good wife, what did Lot's wife do? She just took a peek. <laughs> she took a peek. <laughs> and she turned to stone. So now Lot is left with his two daughters. They flee to the hills nearby, and they're living in a cave. So they've come from the big city to the degradation of a cave. And his daughters get the bright idea that they need to continue, continue the lineage. So they sleep with Lot, their father. They both become pregnant, and two sons are born. One is called Moab, one is called Ammon. And so when you start looking at these Edom, Ammon, Moabites, or Moab, they're all cousins. They're all related okay, to, the, to the Israelites. But yet they had taken a different path, and they're really a pain in the side of Israel. You know, we're, we're talking from Abraham to this point, probably in excess of 1,200 years. So it's a long time. Okay? And, you know, the, the anti-Semitic rhetoric that comes out of many of the nations surrounding Israel is, it's sad, but it's comical because they're Semitic too. They are the same, they came from the same, same people way back when. So, you know, this, this history and this problem has continued for literally millennia. Okay? So that's the connection back to Sodom and Gomorrah. My wife likes to tell me that, that, that God cursed them. <laughs> that, they would always be, that they would always be wild dogs. Well, that was one of the th things that was said to um, Ishmael. Right. You know, wild donkey, I think was the, the term. So, well, she likes to throw that in. There's justification there. I saw for something else. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't their fault. Just God, made, them them. God <laughs> made them that way. Hate, yeah. I guess, is probably, probably good term. So, you know, there's, there's the picture. And we've got to seven. And so there's completion, right? So Israel, the northern kingdom, has got to be cheering at this point in time, except for... Apparently, Amos doesn't care about biblical numerology because he throws in the eighth judgment. And that is in um, chapter 2, verse 6. This is what the Lord said, or says, For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. They sell the righteous for silver, briberies, and the needy for a pair of sandals, they trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. And they, I think Joyce may have used the word trampled on the poor earlier. That's where it's coming from. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. I, I'm not sure what to make of this, whether it's just simply a hooker or it's the temple prostitutes. It could be either one, actually. But in any event, uh, they lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. Now, that's kind of an interesting charge. Um, going back to the Old Testament, 
way back to the law. What you and I'm not sure where to find it right now, but we can look. One of the requirements, if you loan somebody money, you got collateral. We do that today, right? You know, you, you buy a house and you've got a trust deed, which is really, you, you don't get the real deed until you've paid it off. You buy a car on credit. Somebody else holds the registration, the pink slip. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things like that. You go into the credit union, you, you, you use your signature to get a loan. Well, your signature is really collateral or you've used your savings account in there as collateral. So that's not unusual. And in fact, it wasn't unusual at this point in time. In order to get money, some people would um, use their uh, cloak, outer garment, as collateral. But the rule was that if you took somebody's cloak for collateral, you had to give it back to them at night because they needed something to stay warm with, okay? And so what are we seeing here? They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge and therefore not given back in accordance with the law. Now, it can kind of slip by real quick if, you know, if you don't have the, the rest of the story about what the law was all about. Um, the law was specific on things like that, but you know, if you think about it, that may have been the only possession some of these people had. And so you know, we think of Israel as being hot, but most desert areas are hot during the summer and cold during the winter. So, and, and the, the outer garment, this cloak would have provided protection in both uh, extremes. So, um, there's the charges against Israel or the northern kingdom. Okay? It's pretty serious. I'm sure they stopped cheering at that point in time. Okay, let's go ahead and start with the questions. Any comments or questions to this point in time? Hopefully that'll help in some of the areas with the questions. If you can get the right chapter in Amos. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so in theory, we should be looking mostly at chapter 7 through the end of the, the book here. Okay. In question number one, the ones who prophesied were not always professional clergy or <laughs> of war. <laughs> okay. Um, the answer being. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, one of them is. The elders. The elders? <laughs> oh, no, the, the first answer. one. The yeah. Um, this is from Numbers chapter 11, verse 24, and, and that area. Um, this is an interesting story because it occurs just after uh, the Israelites start complaining about not getting everything they wanted to eat in the desert. And so, you know, God says, okay, well, you know, you want meat, I'm going to give you meat. And he promised them quail, not just a day or two of quail or a week or two weeks but a full month of quail. He said, it'll be coming out of your nostrils. You'll have so much quail. And, you know, if you think about, about that picture, not just the nostrils, but the quantity of it, there were probably dead birds all over the place, which I'm sure didn't smell too good in the heat of the Sinai wilderness. Um, so God taught him a lesson. But right after this, Moses really is the leader and the judge and everything of Israel. Now, depending on how you number everything, there's probably two and a half million people. That's a lot of people to look after. And I think it was starting to get to Moses at this point in time. So God said, he tells him, appoint 70 elders, leaders within the nation to help you out. And so he does. And then this particular passage deals with them uh, after God sends his spirit upon them and they prophesy. 
exactly what that means, I'm not really sure. It could just simply mean praising God. Um, but anyhow, that's that's the first uh, one there. What These mean, are the elders. What do you mean by you know what that means? It's just praising God. Well, uh, exactly what they were prophesying about, I don't know. It doesn't really tell us that. But sometimes the prophecy is not the f- the telling the future or anything like that. It's just simply speaking praises of God or speaking the word of God. Okay, and it could have been that simple. But apparently Notice, they only did it once. Yeah. Notice God's request had the number 70. 70. 70, yeah. <clears throat> I guess we need seven elders here in this church. <laughs> that, that four is probably not a good biblical number. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, and then in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 23 through 24, who's, who's there? Yeah, this is wonderful Saul dancing around. And I think it wasn't long after this. What was it? It's 1 Samuel 19? Yeah. It seems to me it wasn't long after this that, uh, yeah. It was just before this that an evil spirit overtook Saul and he starts off on his journey to Never Never Land. Okay. Now we come to Amos. And we've already talked about this, but Amos chapter 1, verse 1. You know, who are we talking about there? A shepherd. In each case, what you find is none of them are really anything more than men called by God. They had a different occupation, a different calling, if you will. But, yeah, go ahead. What was the word you used to? Different occupation or calling? The calling. Yeah. Now, God has called each one of these men. Okay. And we saw that uh, last week when we talked about the book of the Judges. They were all raised up by God, called by God, even a woman of all things. Yes, I read that document. I mean, because they were called up by God, though, it doesn't mean that that was a continuous occupation for them, right? I mean, he could have just called them for one occasion or at this point in time. Yeah. And that was it. Yeah. Because obviously, Amos had been doing something besides being a prophet up to this point. Um, it doesn't really tell us too much about what happened after this period of time, but whether that was the end of Amos or he went back to being a rancher. But other the times there's like 240 prophets, you know, under one yeah. king or something like that, mm-hmm. or other gods or something, I don't know, or they've been led to, what the, the story about the ones who have been led to lie, which was that done by God or was that done by Satan? Led them to lie. Uh, I'm not sure which one you're referring to, but you had the the prophets of Baal. It's on um, First Kings 22, chapter 22. Oh, Ahab, Ahab and Jezebel. The, yeah. This is the prophets of Baal. Yes. No, <laughs> they were the prophets of God, but. He had put a spirit in them to, to lie so that there was only one prophet that was valid of, and of God. Okay, I'll have to read it a little closer than that. But, yeah, it's, it's off text here. Before yeah, well, that's okay. <laughs> I, I would read it for you, but I didn't read my glasses, so I can't yeah. see. I read it today earlier. <laughs> Well, there's not a time frame for Amos to be a prophet. I mean, he uh, t- there's a time period in which he's time operating. Period. But, but uh, no. Once he's a prophet, he's yeah. Uh, there's no indication of what happened after he did his day. after he did his judgment and and so forth. Well, yeah, where, where some of the prophets, it's, it's like Elijah, Elijah, Elijah and Elisha. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they, that is like a good career thing for mm-hmm. some of them. That it, it, they, yeah, they were called essentially for a lifetime. Right, exactly. Yeah. 
yeah. and of course some of them died as a result of being prophets. So, but there's no real indication here as to what happened to Amos. I, I don't know, even know if there's any traditions. Pardon? I don't. I was had a question about something else. So, you finished with your? <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. You, you. I had originally said that okay, then Amos was named, and then what he did for a living to show that he was you common folk. But wasn't that common in that day? Amos the shepherd, or Joe the tanner, or they, that's how they were. To some degree, yes. There are exceptions to that, and if you think back to Samuel, Samuel started his life very soon, um, he was just a young boy, when he was taken by his mother to the temple to be trained. Okay? And, okay. And, and I'm assuming that because of that he was actually of the tribe of Levi. Does anybody know for sure? But the fact that he went to the, or was given to the temple and would be trained um, because Eli was a priest. Right. Okay? So he, um, Samuel was a priest prophet essentially all of his life. That was his role. But that's how we knew which Samuel. What I'm saying is their, their trade was part of their name. It wasn't Samuel Jones. It was Samuel the prophet. Yeah. It was Amos the shepherd. The shepherd. You know, a Peter the fisherman. Mm -hmm. that, that's just part of their name. In some cases, yes. Okay. Yeah, in some cases. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, think about Paul. What What else did Paul do besides preach? He was a Roman soldier. Paul. Paul. Yes, he was a tent maker. He was a tent maker. Paul. Paul. The Apostle Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't he a Roman soldier? He was a Roman citizen. 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 But he was actually a tent maker, and that's how he made it. He made his living when he was out. In well, they didn't area. call him Paul the tent maker. They called him Paul the troublemaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But don't listen the, to me. There's about three hours worth of story between. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I never well, got along well with him. I found a bum <laughs> like outside the city of the wall. Would there be a what? There would be a Tom. The bum that lives outside the city wall. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so next week before we get started, we all have to pick nicknames for everyone else here. Oh, jeez. Question number two. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Amos prophesied against the northern kingdom and predicted that God would judge them and send them into exile. Why would God do this to his people? And this goes back to the verses. Um, there's two sets of them here. He had a list of charges. He had a list of charges. And oh, why do I keep... They had forsaken him. Okay. In chapter 2... Um, those are the ones that we re read just a few minutes ago, you know, trampling the righteous for silver, trampling on the head, heads of the poor, and all of that. Um, chapter 5, verse 7 through about 12, let's see, that was... Um, seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Do not journey to Beersheba. And these are places in which um, Jeroboam the first had actually placed, um, I think he placed uh, the golden calves actually in Bethel and in Dan. But they had also set up shrines in some of these other places like um, um, Beersheba. There was someplace else that slips my mind at this point in time, but there were at least four or five places that, where they had these shrines. And so, um, don't go to these places. For Gilgal will surely go into eth, uh, exile, and Bethel will be reduced to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, or he will sweep through the house of Joseph like a fire. 
It will devour, and Bethel, it will have no one to quench it. You have turned justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. Okay. The charge there is really about these false worship centers. And if you go back to the covenant, it's not so specific on where it will be, but it is specific that there will be one worship center. Okay, And it isn't until later on that that one is um, spelled out to be Jerusalem. Okay. But weren't these others set up so that the northern tribes wouldn't have to go mix with Judah yes. in, yes. in Jerusalem? exactly. Yeah. Okay. When Jeroboam I came to power, he did not want people going down to Jerusalem for a lot of reasons. If they go down there and start hearing about the covenant and all this, they may not come back. Okay? So he wants to have them stay up there for that reason. There's another reason, too. They're going to journey some distance to get to Jerusalem. And even in the time of Jesus, one thing that occurred was... When you travel to Jerusalem for the Passover and the sacrifices, you bought animals there to sacrifice. You didn't carry them with you. To have traveled with, uh, you know, two chickens and a rabbit for 400 miles, or you know, probably 150 miles. Except for donkeys, if they had. If they, yeah. But you wouldn't sacrifice your donkey, right? But you'd have to carry these stinking animals for a long ways, and so. The easiest thing to do is to actually buy them when you get there. And that's really what uh, the money changers and all of that carnival atmosphere in the temple area was when Jesus came in and basically threw them out. These are people who are selling animals at inflated prices again to people coming down for sacrificial animals. So there's an economic side to Jeroboam's restructuring. He wants to keep that up here. Okay. Um, so there were a lot of reasons for actually creating these extra sites. Should have never happened in the first place because it should have never split into two kingdoms. But they were also other gods, right? They, I mean, that was yes. Also, I mean, I think that was... That's who key. That, that was, was key to what. That really was upset a huge people. part of it. Yeah. Um, I don't believe there were other gods. There were other symbols that they, people thought they, were, uh, were gods. Well, but didn't but wasn't he couldn't do anything? Oh, I know he couldn't do anything. But the fact he, is, it was worshiping other gods. Yes. In those yeah. two gods that didn't really exist, but sure, yeah, but you still they're an idol, a, an sort. idol, yeah. Um, so. No, remember when he set up the two golden calves and put right, one, right, exactly. Uh, I think it was Bethel and Dan. Yeah. Okay. He actually used the words, "Here, O Israel, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt." Right. Okay. Now. You know, go back and read the story about Moses coming down from the mer- uh, the mountain, and uh, Aaron basically says, "Oh, we just put all this gold into a pot. Now pop this golden calf. It's it's almost magical. Magical. It's comical. And so you've got the golden calf there, which was a symbol of one of the the Egyptian gods. And now here Jeroboam comes along and says, "Here's the God who brought you out of Egypt." So there's a connection. There's another connection, and I I don't know whether we talked about this last week or not, but one of the symbols of the fertility cult god Baal was a calf, a bull calf. And so now you've got Jeroboam making these golden calves right in the middle of Canaanite territory. And so it would not be hard for the Israelites to make the connection there and start worshiping false gods of the fertility cults. And they did. It didn't take them very long. These people weren't very bright, were they? <laughs> <laughs> no, we aren't. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, know, you know, and it's easy to to judge them in view of our modern society, but 
and we've got our own gods. Oh, you know, and, and somebody this morning brought up the fact that we've got our gods of the iPhone, okay, and to some degree the computer, and it causes a tremendous amount of isolation. You can walk down the street and come across somebody that's texting away, and they haven't the foggiest clue that you're standing next to them or standing right in front of you or right in front of them until they run into you. Okay, so we have our own gods. Um, you know, I, I see one of them as being uh, some of the kids' baseball programs that, boy, they just tear up Sundays because we've got the little league fields behind us, and, and it's just constant over there. And uh, you know, I remember playing little league and even um, higher leagues than that when I was a kid, and we were playing a game. Okay. But Here, it wasn't Sunday morning. No, it was never Sunday morning. Um, but now, I get the feeling that a lot of parents are living <laughs> vicariously yeah. through mm -hmm. the kids, and everybody thinks their son is going to become a pro baseball player. They do play on Sunday morning. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, uh, wow. All over. The, the old parts manager where I work. Said his church was the ball softball field on Sunday. Yeah. He was anti God anyway, but he yeah. said that. Yeah. Um, so you're right. It's, yeah. but his church has a. You know, Al never uh, never uh, spoke to a prophet. I don't believe, and, and he was a quiet. I mean, there was no. He Who, wasn't God. Who's this? Al. Or, uh, yeah, well, he didn't exist. <laughs> he didn't exist. Yeah, that's right. In, in reality. I, I think the difference though between now and using something like the cell phone is it was, I mean, they knew that the people did know the covenant, right? Yeah. And yes. It, wouldn't, it would be like coming to church and not, and I mean, you, I guess you could take the cross to the point of an idol, but we think the cross, we associate the cross with something that is. That happened. That happened. If you take Baal's calves, there's nowhere in the covenant where that is a, made a statement of, you know, of God, of yeah. God yeah. right. Yeah. So. You know, you can, you can take anything that way, right? Really. Um, it can become a God. It can become an idol. It can become the thing that, you know. If it becomes more important than focusing yeah. on God. Yeah. What was it? Luther said something to that effect that uh, whatever you look to for your greatest good is your God. Okay. Now some of us look to the Lord for that and the Word. Others look to other things. Tom, you were going to say something. Uh, I want to take issue with part of that. Okay. Um, I, I don't think that. Okay, um, a little background. Um, at our family gatherings, mm -hmm. um, you could bring up anything. The tea we're having. <laughs> what kind of tea is that? Oh, it's good. Oh, why do you get that there? You know, and, and they ordered right there. Okay. So I'm familiar with all that. <laughs> to say that that's their God, I think, is, is incorrect. I think what's happened is that um, if, you, if you read the screw tape letters by C.S. Lewis, mm -hmm. you see Wormwood in there um, constantly attempting to distract. From, um, from the life that God would have us live. Right. Okay? And anything you can put in, in your way that distracts you is a victory for him. Yes. Because because he's, his sole objective is to get you not to worship God, but do something else. Do something else. Okay? Like walk down the street <laughs> yeah. on Instagram. You know? mm -hmm. um, so it, it's not it's, it, it's not a God in itself. No. It's what it is, 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 is a distraction. It's a distraction. Treasures yeah. on earth, right? You know, yeah, getting good yeah, distracted by treasures, treasures on earth as opposed to spiritual. It's what you do with it. Yeah. You know, you can have a cell phone and use it for its purpose and still worship God. You don't let you don't sit in that's, church. I guess that's what I mean. Yeah. Is, is it's still possible. You haven't rejected God. You, no. You haven't said, I don't believe in him any longer. You haven't yeah, I have become one. overwhelmed yeah. by the cell phone and but locked out everything else. But I've watched the entire thing. 
Okay, from, from back when cell phones were great big huge bricks. <laughs> Way before that, actually, back when phones had cords and tiles. <laughs> um, I remember those too. <laughs> you know, so I've watched the whole thing. And, and I, I see it more as a distraction than ever as a, as a god. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, in that distraction is a real opportunity for Satan to say, you know, you're going to spend less time doing what you what your Lord wants you to do, and more time, you know, checking your Instagram to see and see what's going know, on, what the Kardashians said today, you know, <laughs> or, or, or whatever. Yeah, when it well, becomes an obsession. Pardon? When it becomes an obsession. It, yeah, 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 when it, yeah. yeah. But it is an obsession. It's obvious that it is. Okay, yeah. Yeah. you don't have to drive down any one of the streets of Los Angeles um, for more than ten minutes to see that it's an obsession. It's an well, obsession. but I say, like the, the gamers, when they take it to the next level, the gamers, but they can't stop. It's, it's mm -hmm. they're, they're addiction. They're yeah. addiction. It's a disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. My daughter's got it. One hundred percent got it. She even admits it. Thing is, is, is anything that's if you were to ask Nina, what's the most important thing on this world? It would be her phone, not God, not <laughs> where she lives, not anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's terrible. Is and she actually acknowledges the fact that she she's got a problem. Have you seen the first where they throw all the phones in the, in the shredder? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that must and actually happen because I thought you could get that kind of reaction yeah, out of people yeah. without actually making them think that they're losing their. They took all the cell phones away from them. And they, they pretended that they put them in a shredder oh. and just shredded them all. You should have seen it looks yeah. on their face. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great commercial. Yeah. Their, their entire life is in that phone. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you just shredded it. You know? Yeah. What, how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, I think what I fear more are the parents who say it's okay for their mm -hmm. child to go play baseball on Sunday. That's a, it's not, he's not turning away from God per se, but he's opening wide up to God, to Satan. Mm -hmm. Satan's going to move right in. But that that's got, almost goes back to the screw tape letters, though, because it is a contention between the schools and the sports mm -hmm. and athletics and your child, and if you don't get them to practice, they won't make the team or they mm -hmm. won't get to play. Well, when is practice scheduled? Sunday, Sunday well, then you have to sit down with the child and talk about what's more important. Yeah, I just Boy, can't. That's why they have a first and second service. You can always work around your baseball schedule. So well, apparently the parents, they're all atheists. The, <laughs> well, that's the thing. If the parents, if it's important for their parents, you know, take your child to the 8 o'clock service, everybody get up, have breakfast, go to church. Then you go to the ballpark. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the parents aren't, aren't Christians. No. So, yeah. yeah. There's no way of wearing anything, right? Yeah, in most, you, most cases, yeah. yeah. I, one of them this morning brought up the idea that it's a, a method of isolating people, and I think it isolates us from others. It isolates us from God. What does? Well, these obsessions with oh. whatever it happens to be. In this case, we were talking about cell phones, but I don't think it really matters. You know, that you can you can become isolated. We're just at, we're just at the start. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I can I can guarantee you we're just at the start. And you know, people have a gonna... lot of friends too on that. And I think it's like I watch my daughter. And she'll she'll just scroll through. She has a hundred friends, right? So she'll like it or she won't like it. You know, she's pushing these buttons. Like, what? How important is that? You know what I mean? Not very. Um, yeah, guilty. <laughs> you know, you never you do said, oh, you do do that. Pastor you know, well, to some degree. Yeah. Pastor yeah. said he got caught up in that and he had to back off. He backed off. Well, look at he said it was addictive to him. Yeah. 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 P, you know what Pete Walker does? He doesn't even have Facebook. Yeah. He's a pretty smart man. Yeah. You know, he uses Tina's. Have he uses Tina's, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like everything else we do. Facebook has some advantages. I go on these photographic safaris with a pro and a number of other guys who should be pro. And I can keep in touch with them and see where they're going. We exchange comments about each other's photos and all this kind of stuff. So from my viewpoint, that's a good Part it's a of. hobby. It's a hobby that I have, but I can get some feedback from some guys who are really good. I them. can share it with That's them. There's some really funny stuff out there. Yeah, there is some really <laughs> funny stuff. And that's the good part about it. But some of the other stuff that goes on, you know, 
you can't believe some of the stuff that I see that I don't pass on. Because, you know, and I'm not particularly a um, Hillary Clinton fan or a uh, Barack Obama fan, okay? But some of the stuff I see, even I wouldn't pass that on. It, it's it's over contemptible. The over the top. It's just over the top. And people can hide behind that. The isolation works in a number of ways. You hide behind these types of things, and there's a certain degree of anonymity. But, you know, you send a letter to the editor of the local newspaper, what happens at the end of the letter? Your name, <laughs> Your name shows up in the city you live in. And so that disappears with such things as Facebook. And people say some of the... Nasty. Not only weird, but just plain nasty things. Well, yeah. Bullying, bullying kids. Yeah, yeah bullying it can be. Kids, yeah. yeah. Cyberbully. Cyberbully. Mm -hmm. Which leads to the question: Would God consider that sin? Bullying? What? No, the whole Facebook information age. Well, well it depends I, think on how it's used. I think on how it's used, it could be. Um, is it a sin for me to keep track of some of these other guys that I um, go out to Yellowstone for you know a week or so with? No, I don't think so. Even if it happens to be through Facebook, I'm going to do it one way or another. Letter writing or it's a, I could be using email. I could be using a telephone call to them. Or your example of the internet to just look up something and order mm -hmm. tea. Are you honoring God? <clears throat> yeah. Are you... You're not. Showing that's, that's yourself. Well, you are if you're showing yourself as Christian. Well, yeah, I guess you, you could do that. don't use foul language. Yeah. And you could do that, although the vast, vast majority of it does not. Yeah, yeah some of it's really um, pretty low. I, I just, you know, lately I've really been into what's a sin anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, you know, okay. God, like God forgives them all. I mean, as us parents, we look at our children seeing that that phone is more important than anything, God is looking down, seeing that that phone is more important than anything. So if we're not happy, he's not happy, it's probably not good. Right? Okay, can we press on? <laughs> we have 10 minutes. Now, this morning we went 20 minutes over, so... We I don't, don't want to do that. Too. We're not going to finish this. <clears throat> well... <laughs> Let's go. Okay. Question three. Amos repeatedly used the phrase, the so sovereign Lord showed me. According to Hebrews 1, how did God communicate with his people in the Old Testament? Anybody? Spoke through the prophets. Various ways through the prophets. Okay. Now, if you think back to even all the way back to um, Adam, how did God communicate with Adam? He spoke with him. He spoke with him. We walked and talked yeah. in the garden with him. So, you know, exactly how that happened, we don't want to get too carried away with. But apparently, there was direct communication from God to Adam. And it broke down someplace between Adam and Eve. Okay? Because she I'm ate the... I'm sure you brought this up last week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you probably not quite the same way, but... You know why he was able to communicate directly at that point? Because there wasn't sin yet. Yes, and that's a good point. Yeah. Because what happens afterwards? He has to hide himself in a blurry bush. Yeah. yeah. So things change. Yeah. Um, how about with Jacob? How did he communicate with Jacob? What was Jacob's ladder? <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> yeah, but how how oh, did Jacob? He, he had a dream. Okay. Um, Moses he spoke to him on the mountaintop. He spoke to him on the mountaintop through. And remember, Moses had to turn his back so that he didn't see the full glory of God. There was there was another way. What in, in the burning bush? Okay. Oh, the dark um, cloud and the fire, didn't he communicate that's how Yeah, that was on the mountaintop, yep. Yeah. Okay, that happened several times. Uh, Abraham. God communicated with Abraham, especially during the covenant cutting ceremony where... Oh, when, where he, he was going to sacrifice? No. When he, he uh, God passed between the two halves of the animal. And that was a dream, a vision again. 
Okay. Um, how did God announce the coming birth of Isaac? I've already told you this one tonight. Remember the angels that were on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah? They stopped to tell Sarah she would be she was going to have a child by that time next year. So you know those are the types of things that that did happen. Um, in Amos, this is um, the B part, but in Amos chapter seven, which we'll get Concordia to put in next time, <laughs> chapter seven, verse eight, we have these words: "What do you see, Amos?" So how is God communicating with Amos? Visions. 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 Yeah. Visions. He can see these visions. Yeah, Tom. I don't understand that at all. According to Hebrews? Yeah, I just went beyond that. Fathers through the prophets in various ways. Yeah. But it doesn't say how. No. Various ways would be visions. When we go back to the Old Testament and start looking at all of them, well, then you start to see these other things that that we were talking about. Yeah, it doesn't really tell you. Um, he spoke through the prophets at various times and in various ways. So, and it, you kind of have to go back to the Old Testament to figure out what those various ways are. Well, it was a, it was a um, part C. It's a contrast to how he speaks to us now. Right. Right. Through Christ. Uh, yeah. So, you know, if you think about today in terms of Hebrews 2 and then Luke 24. The, the rest of Hebrews said, but today he speaks through his son. And All the, the Bible. The Bible. One other Always means. Good. One other means. Okay. The sacraments. Oh. We have word and sacrament today is how God speaks to us. And of course, the word... Uh, presents Christ, right? So, isn't uh, those are the only ways today, though, aren't they? That, uh, well, God is not communicating through prophets now. No. Prophets. Well, it, it depends on your oh, definition yeah. of prophets, and I would say that in a sense he still does. You know, we have a prophet standing at the altar every Sunday for ten years, proclaiming the word of God. He was called a pastor, okay? So, yeah, it's not in the same sense as the Old Testament prophets, I guess, but... Uh, well, he's not giving visions or speaking to anybody anymore because he's given us Christ, and it's over. We have, the, word. We have the complete the word. revelation. And if you want to consider pastors as prophets, then they're pointing backwards. To what the, God what said, has already what happened? Has they're not. You they're know, not be careful when they start them. pointing to the future. <laughs> yeah. well, the Mormon Church, they they claim to be a Christian church, but I don't know what a pro. I don't know. That. Yeah, I. Just, yeah, but, just, but that's. Uh, yeah. But their God changes his mind, so you need a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, simple yeah, <laughs> that was the five-second answer, <laughs> which is a good answer at this point. Now. Yeah, so uh, it's somebody who speaks for God. Okay. So if that's, if that's the case, then how is it that Jesus speaks to us through this word? Through the word, the word and sacrament. I know, but but how? Well, you'd have to read it and. The Holy Spirit Spirit. (laughs) gives it to us. The word is being proclaimed every uh, Sunday morning, or it should be, by the pastor, right? And then the... um, Let me put it different. If God had a real message for you, (laughs) for you specifically, okay? Not just, you know, Hebrews 1, but but a real message for you, how, how would you receive it? You would just end up in that direction. I believe. Well, like for instance, I'm going to Mexico this weekend. For what I don't even speak Spanish. Everybody there, I'm, I'm going to be sitting there with a koala, just watching everybody talk. But 
is there a reason? You know what I mean? What if, what, if, what if there's a little boy that comes up to me that knows how to speak English, and I happen to be doing my homework, which I'm taking my Bible with me, and I start speaking to him about Jesus? That could be a reason that I went to Mexico. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I wasn't told to go, but for some reason I'm headed that direction. That would be the best answer. That would be the action of the Holy Spirit. Or, yeah. or the answer, answer to prayer. You know, there's a number of just... Good example. Good example. Right. You know, I hate to use too many personal examples, but there's a number of instances in my own life where I had no clue when things happened. Um, we moved from Camarillo to Southern Maryland, of all places. And I can remember the first night we went back looking for a house, sitting in Lexington Park, Maryland, in the Belvedere Hotel, <laughs> sitting on the edge of the bed with my arm around my wife because she's crying that we're going to Southern Maryland. Why did you take me? <laughs> yeah, and I was committed at that point in time. So you start thinking about stuff like that, and you know, why am I back here? Well, when I came back from Maryland, we had gone through some rather significant Bible studies and problems with an interim pastor. And for some reason, I was put right in the middle of that. Okay? And so, you know, looking back on it, I can see that's where we were supposed to have been. At the time, okay? I guess that's my, the tenor of my question is, isn't can you tell if you're blessed, which is what you're talking about, because you were blessed by that. Okay. Ultimately, yes. Yeah, ultimately, and you could see that, then you see they have God working looking on back. that. Looking back. Yeah. yeah. I'm talking about looking into the future. How did I know at the time that that would be the right thing to do? <laughs> I have no idea. I, it was a, a career decision, if anything, to go back there. You know, I ended up back there in all places. And I mean, if anybody's been to Southern Maryland, it's changed a lot in recent times. But this was back in uh, late so, 70s, early 80s. Uh, it was nowhere. It was out in the country. Now, I ended up... It was a vacation land. <laughs> oh, I learned to love it. And yeah. we came back still married, so... <laughs> and, you know, part of it was not only my job and the church, but I ended up teaching at a community college, which has helped teaching here. Except okay. you never done. Tom, <laughs> my hairdresser claims God speaks to her. She could be all alone in the car, and she can hear him telling her what he wants her to do. I believe that. Okay. See, I, I Some people are blessed that way. Lewis called it um, the quiet, um, gentle speech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The one that's almost like a whisper. But I really believe that, that, that that's true. Mm -hmm. How do you? How could you believe that? I believe that Because that's what he's done. He's done to me before. Oh, you have? Mm -hmm. wow. It ha doesn't happen to everyone because you have to be It's not like this big receptive. receptive. Yeah. Oh, it's not comes down and okay. smacks you and says, says here, come. By yeah. gosh, you got to get on. Get on this right away. It's more like this really quiet, simple yeah. um, understanding. Yeah. I felt the Holy, the Holy Spirit grab my lips and tell me not to speak. And I was about ready to say something. Like, 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 I'm about ready to say something, and I didn't. And I realized at that point. Oh, that was a good move. That I didn't <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I. <laughs> some of us listen, and some of us that's don't. Not, yeah. that's, Okay, let's... <laughs> We're not going to make it, Dave. We're not going to make it. Okay. Are you okay, I, Tom? <laughs> I'm fine. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how to answer your question, really. I think Tom has the answers. Yeah, he's, he's already got <laughs> he's the answer. He's listening to a higher authority. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it's just that, you know, you can talk about things in theory. Right. You know, but I really like it when we get down to how does this work? How can I apply this to my life tonight? Yeah. yeah. And we don't always talk about that. No, we don't. No. Yeah. Um, and, and having cancer has really uh, focused me on, you know, something on, like that. on you know, getting instructions and stuff like that mm -hmm. you know, because it's important. You know? yeah. so, um, so, so to, me, to me, it's all about 
Well, let's, what, what, what can I do? What in the, I know what happened in the past. I know. Well, I'm blessed I am. You see my house. Mm -hmm. and I never had a good job. You did Janice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how I got all that, I have no idea. But the Lord mm -hmm. blessed me with it. Mm -hmm. okay? So I can see that. That's easy. That's it. It's yeah. the stuff in the future. Yeah. The stuff, where does he want you to go? What does he want you to do? Who does he want you to talk to? And why? You know, and yeah. why? And how? And, and sometimes <laughs> I think... people are open to it. To listening. Yeah. Sometimes I think in my own life, you know, I'm not particularly hearing the voice tell me to do something. But I think there's a sense in which do something. And I'll tell you whether it's wrong or not, but do something. You know, quit sitting there, that type of thing. Well, are they put, people are put in, like to say, situations where you, why? why this person at this time mm -hmm. and then a week for later you go oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. and it yeah. comes together we're often impatient for immediate answers you know what Dave you keep looking at the clock You're, you really want to keep to a schedule huh you know, well, <laughs> the schedule is blown <laughs> sir. well here's the thing I don't want you to be stressed out about oh I'm not because we can finish the last couple of questions at the beginning of next Wednesday yeah. right fall a little behind I'd rather fall um, a little behind and cover it it's yes. not like we have before because yeah. <laughs> I know you keep looking at the clock I um, want you to stress out yeah no I, no problem we've gotten through three questions there's 22 <laughs> 21. So <laughs> it is what it is. What I don't want to happen is for your morning class to get different from your evening class. So if but that's the way it goes. That's the way it goes. Yeah. yeah. So we just have to remember where we are. I'll let you know. Yeah. My uh, chief executive officer here will keep me in. But if you think of it, it's me. So what we're doing here is. is Good. Yeah, and these are are really serious and important questions, and I, I sh sure don't have any answers to some of them. Yeah. But it's probably good that we think about them a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I like everybody's input. It, it, it drags us behind, but it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just remember, you are in the company of fellow Christians here, and that's important. Yeah. Um, I think I told the uh, morning class when we first started that. Bible studies are good, but just the fellowship of the group is sometimes as important, if not more so. So. And not just the learning of facts. Like we could memorize the whole Old Testament, but if we don't know how it applies to our life, yeah. and we don't exactly. understand God's purposes in our own life. There, there's one thing, but if you can give me about two minutes. There's one thing that as we continue on with Amos next week, it's, there's a uh, pattern that started in Genesis. It starts with Adam and Eve. It goes through Cain and Abel. It goes through Noah and the Tower of Babel. It goes with Abraham. And it was part of the initial crossways um, stuff. And it was the idea that man sins, God judges, but there is some kind of grace that God provides. It's a cycle that occurs throughout Scripture. It's not just in the first 11 chapters of the Bible. It's sin, judgment, grace. And that's here in Amos. Full bore. Okay? We haven't gotten to everything yet. But in all of the prophets, keep that little pattern in mind. In fact, all of the Scripture. Because... If we're looking for Christ in the scriptures, he is the grace, the answer to the judgment and our sin, the forgiveness of sin. So, anyway. Any last comments then? That took 45 seconds maybe. <laughs> okay, so we'll pick up with question number four next week. And... Uh, yeah, now we have time to do it. <laughs> yeah, now, now you know how it goes and we can figure it out. Thank you all. Thanks for listening to this Bible study presentation from Faith Lutheran Church in Moore Park, California. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.com.